Hi, in this tutorial we're just going to go over a really basic introduction to NMR spectroscopy. So if you've ever seen NMR, which means uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, so nuclear magnetic resonance, it's just a spectroscopic technique that actually deals with um, the nucleus of atoms. Um, so if I just draw an atom here, very basic one, and I'll put the electron there spinning round. If we look at other spectroscopic techniques, other spectroscopic techniques look at bonds, uh, look at the electrons and look at the interaction of the electrons um, no matter what technique they are, they, they're usually dealing with the outer edges or even the valence electrons of an atom. Now what makes NMR spectroscopy unique is that it actually gets right into the core and it only looks at the core of the atom, the actual nucleus of the atom. So it's not bothered about the electrons and the, the advantage of that is that this core is, is really undisturbed. It can be um, they can, these molecules be going through lots of collisions and things like that, and but the core, the nucleus, remains intact. So we can actually see it and identify the actual environment in which this nucleus is present. And why is that important? Well, it's very important if you want to look at um, nuclei in different environments and how they're interacting with other atoms. If you look at infrared spectroscopy, for example, you, you get um, you don't really get as much detailed information about the the quantum world as you would do with NMR, and that's because of these collisions and other energy states that the electrons can exist in. So you just get like a broad. So if you look at if I drew um, uh, an infrared spectrum, for example, you'd have something like this, and then you'd see a carbonyl or something like that, a bit of fingerprint region stuff, and they look very similar to that. And, what well, these are, these are actually individual molecules, the vibrational states of individual molecules that are slightly in different um, collision modes or uh, different energy states, and they all give rise right to this very broad uh, spectrum, really. Um, so it's not a well defined peak there, so that carbon R peak is not coming out at a certain defined number, it's coming out at a, a range, a distribution of, of uh, frequencies, if you will. Okay, so. That's basically um, an explanation of why NMR is very useful to chemists, especially. Um, but it's also used in um, MRI and things like that to look inside um, um, people or, or animals and things like that. But I won't go into MRI in this tutorial. So nuclear magnetic resonance that's, um, deals with the nucleus. Nothing else doesn't look at the electrons. The electrons are involved in, in certain um, couplings. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss later on, um, but we're just dealing with the nucleus. So why is that important? Why have I spent so much time talking about the nuclei of different atoms? Well, it's because if you have a different isotope of an atom, so of an element, sorry. So we take um, hydrogen. Hydrogen has got um, atomic number and a mass number of one, but deuterium has got um, atomic number of one but a mass number of two okay or sometimes it's written like that two okay so this this is the mass number because it's got an extra nucleon it's got an extra uh, some uh, atomic particle there it's got a, 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 a neutron sorry I was trying to write that and say it at the same time so that's a neutron and that's a proton. Okay. Now each um, proton, sorry, each nucleon, so it's either proton or neutron, has its own spin state. So a proton, on its own, has spin a half. And that's because these are actually made up of quarks, and each quark has got its own spin state. But I won't go into that detail at this moment because we're trying to stick to chemistry, not physics. So. The, the quarks make up, uh, give rise to the, the actual spin state of the um, uh, subatomic particle, so the, the proton or, or the neutron. 
And when these add together, they give rise to different forms of, um, of a nuclear spin. So deuterium has a nuclear spin of one, and a proton has a nuclear spin of a half. Now, nuclear spin of a half is really useful for organic chemists. So I'm just going to um, talk about them for now. I won't go on about all the other uh, nuclei with different spin states. What I wanted to emphasize here, really, was that different isotopes have different nuclear spins. So that could be useful for us in the future to find out, you know, if we've got um, different isotopes present in our molecule and things like that. Also, one thing to note is that if the mass number, so if I draw carbon 12, if the mass number for um, the element is even and the atomic number is also even, then the nuclear spin I, sorry, this is called I, the nuclear spin, is zero. So it's almost as though the, the spins cancel themselves out. If you want to think about what spin is, um, it's just if, if a charged particle um, spins, it'll generate its own magnetic field. It's just like any current going through a wire will generate a magnetic field, so it's the movement of uh, charge, really, that generates a magnetic field. And that magnetic field will interact with other magnetic fields. So that's really what it's, what it's about on a basic level. So we put a, a molecule, so we've got ethanol, okay? That's an E. So ethanol, if I write it, it's like that. But if I draw it out structurally, it's like that. If I put that um, molecule inside uh, an NMR machine, I would actually see three different types of hydrogens. Now, if you've seen any of my other tutorials, you'll notice that all the time I say I call hydrogens protons. And that's because I'm looking at the proton, which is that, and not the deuterion, the, the nucleus of the deuterium atom. So I, I tend to talk, call um, hydrogens protons all the time. So during the, the rest of this tutorial, I'm probably going to call them protons. And basically, that is just the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. So we look at ethanol we have three different types of protons. And why have I said that? Well, because these protons are next to different elements. And the what's around those elements, so this one's next to oxygen, this one's next to carbon, but this one's next to carbon as well. But unfortunately, this carbon's got three hydrogens around it. This one's got two hydrogens, one oxygen, and a carbon. And this has got a bond to that carbon, obviously, as well. So this these hydrogens are feeling slightly different field to these ones, and I'll explain why that is in a second. So we actually see in the NMR spectrum of this, if you ever run it, three different peaks for these hydrogens. Now, these peaks arise simply because, if I just scroll this up a little bit, the hydrogen nuclei, when they're placed in a magnetic field, will split into two different types of spin states, if you will. Now, they've not changed, but imagine it's like a compass needle. OK, so you've got a compass needle that's pointing north and south. It will always try and point north. If you give that a flick, it will it'll flick round and then it will try and point north again. In a proton or a hydrogen nucleus, it actually can exist up and down. So if I draw it up and I draw it down. Now, if that's the direction of the Earth's magnetic field, I'll call it mag Earth. Okay. That's the compass. It will try and point north. It will try and align itself north. If we look at, I'll just move these down a little bit. If we look at a nucleus of an uh, element in a magnetic field, then because it's got nuclear spin, it's actually got its own little tiny magnetic field, it will try and align itself with the direction of the magnetic field. So if I draw that in blue, so this is a magnetic field, and it's going in that direction, that's where the strength is, like north to south, sir. So, or let's say call that north and call that south. It doesn't matter. 
really, which is arbitrary. So if it's going in that direction, all the field lines are going in that direction. So then these are the nucleus. Remember, it's just the nucleus, not the electrons. The nucleus will try and point in that direction to align itself. And that's the lowest energy state. And that will be this one here. And we call that alpha. And that's, we'll call that plus a half. And I'll explain where that comes from in a second. Now, it can also exist pointing down. So it's like, it's, I don't know. I try and think of this as a wind, okay? So the wind is blowing in that direction. So imagine the wind can easily take over this arrow and get caught in there and push it in that direction. And if it's sideways, it'll want to flip it over like that. And if it's in this direction, pointing straight down, it can actually brush past it, it's actually stabilised, but as soon as it goes out at an angle again, it'll flip. Because the, the wind, if you think of the magnetic field as being a wind, it will push it in one direction or the other. So it's kind of stable there. It's more stable here, uh, but because it, it's, it, when it faces this wind, if you will, it's not wind really, obviously, um, when it faces that wind, it will, it will be stable in that position. So it actually can exist in two states. So this is the upper state here. This is a beta state. And that's called minus half. Now, these values, I won't go into in this tutorial, but these values are just separated by one. Okay? So, um, plus a half minus minus a half well, should be one. So, delta, the difference there is one. Okay, and that's, that's just a selection rule from quantum mechanics, which I won't go into. But basically, all you need to know is there is a, a difference between these two states, a slight, slight difference in energy. And that slight difference in energy, if I just move it up, delta E, I'll call that delta E, that's the difference between that energy level and that energy level. That difference in energy we can actually measure. So just like any other spectroscopic technique, we pump in a radio frequency or a magnetic field at a particular strength and it will absorb at a particular frequency. And that's called the resonance frequency. And that's where nuclear magnetic resonance comes from. Uh, it's a resonance frequency. And that will be dependent on the magnetic field strength. So, for example, if you take a 400 megahertz NMR, which is probably typical of a, a laboratory or something like that, and these go up to um, a, a gigahertz, you know, like a thousand megahertz these days. And without wanting to uh, let the tutorial become um, historical, you know, I'm sure they're going to increase in, in value in these field strengths. The size of the magnet actually determines the diff, diff, sorry, the difference between these two energy states. So if I drew this line here means not in a magnetic field. So when they're not in the magnetic field, you can't tell the difference, isn't it? Because basically there's no wind blowing on them, so you can't tell the difference. They, they exist in the same spin states. Uh, flipping up and down like that. But once they're placed in the magnetic field, you see differences. And if I just draw one going that way and one going this way, you'll actually see a lot of these diagrams in... So in this, this line across here, say, if I draw that there like that, this will be um, the energy going that way. And let's call this... I'll call it the field strength of the magnet, yeah? So that's the field strength of the magnet. Now I'm making these values up slightly, but if you look in your textbooks, you'll probably see, I'm just trying to get a red pen, you'll probably see diagrams similar to this. So say that's 400 megahertz. That's, uh, and these, this is actually, when you quote this value for 400 megahertz, that's actually the resonance frequency of the proton. So it's the resonance frequency of hydrogen, really. And it's, it's changes um, for whichever nucleus you're looking at, but the machines themselves are labelled according to the proton uh, frequency. So if we look at that, and I'll just draw a dotted line through there, da -da -da -da, like that. So this is, I don't know, 800 megahertz. You see that the energy difference between um, different field strands gives rise to a larger 
sorry, the different field strengths gives rise to a larger energy gap. And that's really useful. Because we're trying to differentiate when we when we look at a spectrum, an NMR spectrum, we're actually trying to detect the differences between one state and another. And unfortunately, even though there are millions and trillions of protons in a molecule, well not in this one, but in a molecule, remember you're going to have uh, an Avogadro amount of this, a molar amount of, of these, so there are millions and millions and millions of these protons. Um, some of the protons will exist in the lower state. I'll try and draw this here. Now without going into exact figures, I think the best thing to do would be to write I'm gonna one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We because of Boltzmann's uh, distribution, there'll probably be ten in that one, and there's probably about nine in this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. And what you want to do is you want to separate these as much as possible because at room temperature they're more or less the same and so you can't really detect you're looking for differences and out of all those millions and trillions there's only eight difference in the two states and you're trying to look for that difference between uh, being detected from those tiny few that are different so the larger the energy gap the fewer will be in the upper states so you'll have more here because at equilibrium it will tend to be in the lower energy states because this requires energy to go into the state. So the bigger the field strength of the magnet, the better sensitivity you have for NMR because you can detect um, transitions easier. There is, there's a bigger differentiation between uh, what's in this state and what's in this state. And that's just based on Boltzmann um, laws really and Boltzmann's distribution. So the take home message from this diagram is that uh, the larger the field strength of the magnet, the bigger the energy difference, the better um, the detection you'll have of the particular nucleus you're looking at, either a proton for looking at hydrogens, and if you're an organic chemist you want to look at carbon. And then remember before I, I did say carbon-12 has got no spin, so you can't actually see it. But we do have carbon-13, carbon-13, and that having that extra neutron gives rise to a spin of a half which is fantastic unfortunately it's in low abundance so it's not as sensitive as looking at hydrogens but we can detect it and we do detect it so because basically just same principles as before there's a lot, quite a lot of um, carbon atoms in a mole of a compound okay so that's that's basic introduction to uh, why we see a magnetic um, resonance effect. So you've got this. You've got this alignment of the nucleus. It is just looking at the nucleus, not looking at the electrons. So it's different to other spectroscopic techniques. And I'll go into detail of um, different spin states and and, and different um, coupling constants and all the things that you probably need more information on. This has just been an introduction to why you actually see different spin states and why they exist and why they're happy to exist in different spin states as well. So I'll end the tutorial there, and, and the plenary, the take-home message is you must have a nucleus spin for your nucleus. Um, your nucleus, um, if, if it has a, an even number of um, atomic mass and an even number of the atomic number, then you won't see any spin at all. The spin's actually derived from the nucleons in the atoms. The energy difference is determined by the magnetic field strength of the magnet and, and that's pretty much it I think oh yeah and the, the energy difference is um, the actual signal you see the signal strength goes up with the field strength of the man magnet as well because of this Boltzmann distribution and it changes the population of these two states so I will just briefly bring that back up to the beginning so this is NMR spectroscopy, a basic introduction to why we see nuclear spin.